about uh, Dr. Uh, Hankao Shi. Uh, he is uh, currently an associate professor of physics at Sonoma State University, where he joined in 2004. He has been the director of the Keck, uh, Keck Microanalysis Laboratory for seeing the facilities in the laboratory, such as scanning electron microscope with uh, energy dispersive X-ray <coughs> spectrometer, Auger electron spectrometer, atomic force microscope, and pow powder X-ray diffractometer. He has been the advisor of the Society of Physics Students chapter at the Sonoma State University since fall 2007. He received his BS and Master's Master of Science degrees in physics from Nanjing University in China and received his uh, PhD degree in physics uh, from West Virginia University, where he continued as a postdoctoral research associate for two years. As a material scientist, Dr. Shi has been uh, concentrating <coughs> on masking, um, on, sorry, on making uh, <coughs> semiconductors and uh, thin uh, magnetic uh, films using molecular beam uh, epitaxy, uh, magnetron sputtering, and chemical vapor disposition. He was one of the pioneers of, in the field of uh, magnetism and magnetic materials to say the interface coupling between a weak ferromagnet and a ferromagnet at low temperature. Many of the publications, uh, many of these, these publications appeared in uh, prestigious journals such as, such as uh, Physical Review Letters, Physical Review B, and uh, Applied Physics Letter. He has also given many presentations at national conferences. So here is Dr. Shi. Can you switch it? Yes. You may have to reduce the resolution. It should be okay. My computer is pretty slow. Because of funding. <laughs> uh, thank you, Ali, for the introduction. And uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, this is really a, a nice day to uh, show you all what we have been doing in the last year or two. And uh, I'll start with my uh, outline. So here you are going to see uh, a few things. Really, uh, first of all, i like to show you this, the, uh, the scale of different things. Now, some of you probably have seen uh, this thing at the, the uh, National Nano Initiative website. And then, anyway, I'm going to briefly talk to you about the physics at this nanometer scale. Why this thing is interesting. What is really going on in terms of uh, physics? And then, in particular, because I've been really working on this magnetism and uh, magnetic materials, I'm going to show you briefly what is really driving the advancement of this particular field uh, when things are small enough. And after that, I'll show you two traditional methods, how people in industry, for example, make these nanometer scaled uh, materials or devices. And then I'll show you these are two projects that we've been uh, working on. And one of them is this uh, self-assembly of this aluminum oxide. The other one is the uh, zinc oxide and uh, how we characterize or measure these samples. And uh, followed by possible ap applications. Where are we going to really use this? Then I'll summarize. And uh, uh, So here's the, the scale of different things. If you go to this www.nano.gov, you're going to see that on the left side, these are the things you see, uh, not every day, but it's basically something from the nature. Starting from these little ants, that the size here is about a, a few millimeters, down to a little dust mite, which you can really see under the, uh, for example, the scanning electron microscope. It's about 200 microns. If you want to go to something even smaller, you, you could talk about these red uh, blood cells. These are typically a few microns. And if you really jump to something, let's say, DNA or atoms of silicon, well, then you know you're really talking about this nanoscience and nanotechnology, because things down there, it's about a, a couple of nanometers in diameter. 
Now the right side here, basically, you can make this thing in the lab or industry. People make this thing. So typically, you can go from a uh, you know little pin that's about a couple millimeters all the way to, for instance, this is a quite hot these days. It's the uh, carbon nanotube. So you can use this carbon nanotube to make these electrodes to conduct the um, uh, current. Or if you look at something, this is basically uh, what IBM did about uh, 25 years ago. That they used the scanning tunneling microscope uh, used at a tip to actually drag or put a one iron atom at a time on the surface of copper to form this little nice ring here. So eventually you have 48, for example, 48 uh, iron atoms on the surface of uh, that uh, uh, copper here. Uh, so, so of course now, as you can see here, that the, the, the most interesting thing here is uh, what is really uh, happening when something goes down to this nanometer scale, which is typically it refers to this from one to 100 nanometers. And as you all know, one nanometer is basically one um, billionth or one part out of uh, billion. So as a material sci a scientist or a physicist now, one thing you can do here is to do some sort of estimate just to see what exactly happens when the dimension of the cluster goes from a few uh, millimeters to a few nanometers. So here I'm going to do a quick uh, rough estimate. So assuming that I have a little tiny sphere that the diameter here is two times this capital R, and inside I have these closed packed atoms that the uh, uh, radius here is a little r. What's important here now is, as you can see, if you look at the number of atoms on the surface, well, assuming again these atoms are closed packed, divided by the total number of atoms in this sphere, well, it's not really that hard to eventually see that the ratio here is really the little r to the big r. And that in itself tells you, if I have something, let's say, the atom, typically the size is about a couple of uh, angstroms or 0.2 nanometers. So if you have a little tiny pin head, let's say big R is 2 millimeters, you realize this ratio here is almost zero. But on the other hand, if you look at this nanometer scale feature here now, for instance, when you have this capital R here is only 2 nanometers, this ratio now becomes 10%. And remember, in this nanoscience or nanotechnology, it is these surface atoms that are making the contact with the different materials. Right? So it does not really matter how many atoms you have inside. Eventually, it's these atoms on the surface that are going to talk to the neighbors. Right? So that really made a difference when things, again, uh, come down to this nanometer scale. On the other hand, one can also look at the density of states uh, because of this quantum confinement. So here's the uh, number of available states per uh, EV or per joule. And you can really see three different curves. This one here, it's parabolic. If you can look at the, a, any solid state of physics, it tells you why this is a continuous. It's a, pa a parabola here. On the other hand, if you now reduce the size from 3D, which is a bulk material, to 2D, uh, it's a thin film, then the density states, it really becomes these steps here. And if you shrink this another dimension, when you make these quantum wires, now you see a lot of spikes here. And this is telling us that the number of electrons, how they occupy the material, eventually is going to be totally different because of the way how they really have uh, these different energy levels. And so here, um, I'm showing you a uh, sort of a classical quantum mechanical example. When you have this quantum well, which really is a quantum wire, in one direction, um, electron is going to be totally confined. So if you do uh, that shooting equation, which I believe many of you really know how to do this, you will see the energy level here is not continuous anymore. Right? This is going to be proportional to this quantum, the, the principal quantum number n. And that's telling you the electron here now, it behaves like a standing wave as it's going back and forth. Okay? Not like the classical physics anymore. So things are not really going to be continuous. So of course now one can talk about many other things in terms of that uh, uh, quantum physics. On the other hand, well, you may wonder, so why small is really that good? Why so many people, so many companies are trying to make something small? So here's the, um, a nice chart which really brings us back to 1965 or 19, 
70. When the co-founder, uh, Gordon Moore, predicted it. So he, back then, he only had the data up to like 1970. So he predicted that the number of these transistors on a computer chip is going to increase, not in a linear fashion, but actually it's going to be exponentially uh, incre uh, increased. So here's what the, uh, his prediction really is. N is going to be proportional to the 2 to the time divided by every 18 months. So for every 18 months, or roughly every two years, you will see the number is going to double. All right, so this is now the data up to 2010. So as you can really see, it follows very nicely as a straight line, but you do notice that this left side y axis here is, it's not really linear scale, it's logarithmic. So that's telling us that what he said was really true up to this moment. But the question is, is this thing still going to be true in another five or 10 years? Uh, we don't really know. So people are still working hard to support this notion that every 18 months or so, we can really double the number of uh, these, uh, the, the transistors. So the good news again, it was just yesterday that uh, if you read the news, uh, Intel actually in the first uh, quarter, they made $2.5 billion. As we all know, we're facing this tough you know, uh, economy. Every company is really struggling to survive. This Intel they are still making huge money. So this is why people say, well, small here is really big. It's a big uh, business here, right? Uh, now, since I've been really working on this magnetism, I want to show you the other thing which you really do or use every day. It's the magnetic hard drive uh, disk. So this is a picture from uh, Seagate that if you look at the 3.5 uh, inch disk, you will see in the last 20 years or so, the uh, capacity, which basically is how much information you can really write to such a, uh, a disk drive, you will, you, again, you see a straight line, but it's still you notice this y-axis is uh, logarithmic. So that's telling us the capacity also increases as a function of time, not really in a linear fashion. So this is telling you that in principle, while well, people are basically making these devices and they are really now shrinking the size of each cell, so they can put more information to the same size uh, disk here. Uh, a little bit of fundamental thing about this data recording, because you may wonder how this magnetic um, uh, disk really writes the data or reads the data. So here's how it works. Imagine this is the disk that you have. Inside, you're going to have a lot of magnetic materials. Typically, you have these thin films. So what this magnet does here is, when you try to write the information, we know it's basically it's a series of zeros and ones. Right? So you basically magnetize this uh, material. So these arrows here tell you how the uh, moments are aligned in the plane of the thin film. Now, on the other hand, you say, look, I just say downloaded a movie from the, the internet, then later you want to really watch the movie. So the way you do this is inside there is a read sensor, right? which eventually is going to move around and based on the orientation of each um, moment is going to really know whether this is a left or right. And if left is zero, uh, right is one, then you are basically seeing uh, this sequence of zeros and ones. So this one here is uh, it's sort of like a three-dimensional view of the, uh, the orientation of these moments in such a disk. All right? So this little disk here can now, uh, for instance, in uh, back to January um, of 2010, Seagate can now put 1.5 terabytes to such a disk. So this is just amazing, um, as you can see. On the other hand, uh, a few years ago, people already realized that at some point, we're going to really run into this bottleneck, that you cannot keep shrinking the size of the cell. So one idea here is that you can, instead of using these magnetic moments aligned in the plane, well, you can actually make these moments perpendicular to the plane. And doing so, you can actually now increase the information uh, story density by a factor of three or four uh, because of the, the size of the domain here. So each magnetic domain here, each arrow really tells you the uh, magnetic domain. So by doing this, you, you can really, again, make another maybe three or four times more density. But eventually, no matter what you do, you are going to really hit this hard wall because nothing can be really smaller and soon enough, you will also run into something called super paramagnetic um, uh, thermal noise here, meaning 
if two hours ago you just said downloaded a movie, then because of the thermal energy, because we know we live in a world that the temperature is basically, uh, you know, 40, 45 degrees, and, and you're going to lose all the information. So you're not really going to be able to watch the movie anymore because of that uh, domain switch, right? So the question here now is, so for example, how Intel really say makes that, that uh, money, you know, what do they really do? Uh, so typically you're going to see two different approaches. One of them is called a, a top-down approach, meaning you start with something that's really big, and then you can use this um, optical technology called a photolithography, uh, which starts with, for instance, a piece of silicon wafer, and then on top of that you can really oxidize that silicon, and then after this, you also go to the surface with a photoresist. And the idea here is, now I want to really make something small, so what I do here is I can really put this photo mask on top of this, uh, the uh, photoresist. Then I can turn on this UV light source. The way that uh, this works eventually is, okay, now you can really see uh, some of the, the uh, photoresist is going to be exposed to that uh, uh, UV light, depending on how you design this photo mask. So for instance, if this one, let's say this square here is black, then you know light cannot really penetrate. So this piece here is eventually is going to be unexposed. On the other hand, you can also talk about the two different techniques using these negative resist versus the positive resist. The main idea is, okay, using this lithography technique, you can actually make something um, down to 200 or 300 nanometers. The problem of this approach is eventually you run into this diffraction limit because of that lambda, right? So most of us know uh, if you've taken that optics, you know that you cannot make things really small. So one idea in industry is, well, why don't we use electrons? And so this is one particular um, uh, thing, uh, quite interesting in terms of the wavelength because now you can really reduce the wavelength from a few hundred nanometers to almost like a few nanometers, right? or even smaller. So here's a typical setup in a lab or in, in industry, how people really do this. You have a computer that controls the photo mask. So eventually you can really now dump the, the pattern to this IC uh, circuit. And uh, of course now the, the disadvantage there, it's, it's a pretty slow process. And typically uh, in order to make a real useful device, one has to repeat the process 30 or 50 times. So the question is, do we have some other approaches? So here's a different one, which is called a bottom-up. So the idea is, now of course, if you look at these big pictures, these are basically uh, rocks after the, uh, the eruption of uh, these volcanoes. And it forms really the, uh, nicely, it forms these hexagonal uh, arrays. On the other hand, if you look at something small, for instance, it's a chemical polymer, PMMA, there are two different blocks, A and B. So let's say the red one is A, the green one is B. When you mix this A and B, it's nice enough that the uh, shape of this polymer eventually depends on the uh, ratio of A to B. And if you look at something even smaller, well, you can talk about DNA, which itself also it repeats itself without having to apply any external force. And that is why it's called self-assembly. Right? Normally, if you really want to say have or form a certain uh, pattern, you have to force it. This one it's basically out of nature. You don't have to do anything by just having the right ratio, you can actually now achieve, um, make this type of um, pattern here with a regular um, pattern, such as the, the one that I'm going to talk about now. So this is the, uh, called, the technique is called anodization of aluminum. And uh, just to remind you, it's not really a new technique. It was really back to almost 100 years ago when people first used this anodization of aluminum which is to basically oxidize the aluminum. So you can form that oxide, and oxide in itself is nice enough to cover the surface of, of, of aluminum, so you don't really worry too much about the further oxidation. On the other hand, aluminum oxide, it's also a lot harder than aluminum. So you can basically increase that wear resistance and adhesion. Um, now, almost 15 years ago, there's a group in Japan uh, led by Masuda, Haiki, Hariki uh, Masuda. He discovered that if I use this anodization of uh, aluminum, uh, when I have these right parameters in terms of the voltage concentration of the acid, well, when you look at something down to this nanometer scale, you do see it looks like honeycomb-like structures, and it is perfectly regular. You don't really have to do anything if you have the right voltage and concentration. 
So that is a very typical uh, example of this self-assembly. All you have to do really is to apply the voltage and you know you have the right solution and so on. And the nice thing about this technology is where well, you can make something that has a huge aspect ratio, meaning you can look at the height, which could be a few microns, but when you look at the diameter of each hole, it's about 20 or 30 nanometers. So that in itself is really a very, very close example to a quantum wire. Okay? So that's um, what happened 15 years ago. Now, the main idea, of course, now we have to sort of look at the chemistry here, that you start with this aluminum, then you apply certain voltage to the solution, and with the aluminum is, now here, it's positively biased, and platinum is negatively biased. And you notice the material, the starting material has to be really, really pure, right? Because otherwise you're going to have a lot of uh, impurities in that, and which does not really work um, that well. And uh, followed by this mechanical polish and electro polish. And so the next thing you do here is you pick a particular acid. In our case, we use that uh, 0.3 molar uh, oxalic acid. And when the voltage is right, you're going to really see the formation of this array here. Now, most people believed that this is array here is really due to the uh, imperfection of that surface because you can imagine no matter how hard you try it, surface itself cannot be atomically smooth. There's always some little bumps or um, people call uh, it's the, uh, the, the dimples, right? So things are going to be slightly up and down at the surface and that really um, is the, the starting point of this, uh, this, uh, this growth here. So this is a typical setup that we have in the lab. So we have a computer that's connected to the uh, Pascal interface and then here's the chemical cell. That this gray part here is aluminum, the top portion here is the, uh, the solution. So we pour the solution into this. Then platinum wire, it goes to a resistor which is going to be um, uh, used to measure the voltage. So we can actually uh, monitor the current. Right? And here's the uh, DC power supply. So notice that aluminum here is positively biased, and that's why it's called anodization, because aluminum is the anode. Uh, so to really know what is going on here, well, one has to make sure that surface is really smooth before you start. So here's the uh, typical atomic force microscope image of the aluminum after the mechanical polish, and you realize that this is a pretty small scale here, so five microns uh, squared, and the color bar here tells you how rough or how smooth the surface is. And uh, overall, uh, you should be quite happy because the roughness is only 20 nanometers. But that's still not good enough. So one also has to now electropolish this. So here's what uh, happens after that electropolish at uh, 30 volts. So as you can see, overall, the surface roughness now is almost like in the order of magnitude, uh, better than the uh, mechanical mechanically polished surface. But uh, when you look really into all the details, you know, we decide to use that uh, 30 volts to 30 seconds as um, the, the starting uh, aluminum plate. And clearly, as you can see, if you wait too long, then surface eventually becomes rougher and rougher, right? Even if we're still talking about a nanometer uh, scale. So here's, this is basically what we're going to use. Uh, 30 volts, 30 seconds. Um, now, so this is what happens when you do the anodization. If you monitor the current as a function of time, you can imagine that as the reaction goes on and on, well, eventually you are going to reach this um, saturation. But initially you see the current decreases. That is because of the formation of the oxide. And oxide itself, it has a lot more resistance than the metal. So um, once you start forming these nanometer scaled little holes, then the resistance is, is going to stay more or less the same. Because electrons can always find a way to, um, to be dumped to the, uh, the positive side. Right? So that kind of makes sense in terms of um, anything that you learned in say, physics 214 or 314. Uh, now, it sounds like it's, it's uh, something easy. You can really you know, get this nanometer scale self-assembled um, uh, feature here. But uh, the reality is it does take a lot of time to search for all these right parameters. Right? So this is a picture that uh, Stephen Anderson took about a year ago after we really um, you know, did some work and, and uh, had these right parameters. So what I'm showing you here is basically the SEM picture of one of the samples, and the scale here is basically one micron, and this one is 500 nanometers, and eventually you can see something even uh, better, and this one is 200 nanometers. So if you count how many little holes you have within that 200 nanometers or 400 nanometers, well, typically 
the size here or the dimension here are telling us the distance between two um, pores here is about 130 nanometers. On the other hand, each little pore here is about 90 nanometers, so slightly less than 100 nanometers. And one can also do a quick calculation just to see uh, the density of this nano pore. It's about 100 uh, uh, billion per inch squared. Right? So the idea is, well, what if we later say, stuff these little tiny holes with something magnetic? Then you can really force these little domains into each little hole so that the magnetic bits, if you look at the data storage uh, density here, you could possibly get something up to 100 gigabits uh, per inch squared. Right? So this is the one way, again, using this self assembled feature, one can actually make these um, little tiny disk with uh, that density, 100 uh, gigabytes. <clears throat> now, to better understand the, the formation or how, what exactly we have in this aluminum oxide, here's a picture of what we have in the Keck lab um, on the other side of the building. So this is basically the SEM. What we did there was to look at this EDX spectrum, which basically tells us if I hit this thin film with a high energy electron. Eventually, well, some of the electrons in the material are going to be knocked out because of that energy exchange. But that's not going to be a stable state because you are creating these little holes in that material. So what happens right after this is electrons. Some of the electrons are going to really fall back to these lower energy states because a system always wants to reduce the total energy, which emits the X-ray. So that's how the EDX really works. And from this, you can really tell that we don't really have anything other than that um, oxygen and aluminum. This little tiny peak here, the, um, that's really due to uh, the fact we used the phosphoric acid to uh, widen these little tiny uh, holes to make it uh, then visible under the SEM. On the other hand, we were also interested in seeing the ratio of that aluminum or oxygen to alum aluminum. Because typically you would uh, think that this should be AO2 um, oxygen 3. But the reality here is, no, it's not really uh, 1.5 to 1. So what we discovered was it's slightly less than that 1.5. And the question here is, are we really seeing a crystalline um, aluminum oxide or it's basically amorphous? So here's a picture of the x-ray that we have in the lab. So we did the uh, x-ray diffraction here, and this is basically what the data says. Uh, before you do the anodization, well, typically it's because it's a pure aluminum. So you really see aluminum itself is going to have so many different peaks. But the point here is that after we did the anodization, now when you focus on this lower uh, angle side, you do see we have a quite a broad uh, background here, which is a, an indication that the aluminum oxide is amorphous. Because typically if you have something that has a high quality uh, uh, it, it, high quality crystal, you would see a sharp peak like this one here. But we did not really see anything other than uh, this broader peak here. So in terms of that uh, 2D sine theta equal to m lambda, which really is at a blank uh, condition, one can certainly conclude that the part we made here due to that anodization is really amorphous. All right? So you don't really have long range order. So in this aluminum oxide, things are quite uh, in interesting in terms of that uh, crystal uh, structure here. So I'm going to now skip all these details and uh, I want to now move on to the next topic because this is something that eventually you will see why we made all these little tiny nanopores. Right? So I'm going to now switch to a different topic which is semiconductors. Right? So the material that we make in the lab is zinc oxide. All right? Now this material, here's a picture of what this zinc oxide really looks like. It's basically, it's a hexagonal crystal. Right? The nice thing about this is the material itself is a direct band gap uh, material. Now many of you are taking semiconductors so you probably know what I meant here when something is a direct band gap material. It really means that if you have um, a laser or something hitting this material eventually you're going to see these radiative uh, recombination which t tells you you, ha you, can, you could possibly use this as an uh, um, optical sensor or for solar cells these days, this is also a pretty hot topic in industry. So in any event, that the, uh, as you can see here, the band gap between the conduction band and the valence band, it's about 3.4 EVs. That's a lot more than 
silicon. So silicon, as you know, it's only 1.1, right? It's in the infrared. Now this one, clearly, uh, if you prefer to talk about the uh, wavelengths, it's about 370 nanometers. So it's kind of in the uh, UV region. So the nice thing, again, here is that you are talking about a direct band gap material, which could be used for all these optical sensing and so on. Um, on the other hand, so how does this thing have anything to do with this nanostructure and the nano uh, technology here? Now, a couple of years ago, uh, almost four years ago, there's a group in uh, France calculated how the um, zinc oxide band gap changes as a function of the size of this zinc oxide. And they also did many different experiments. So here, the graph basically tells you that the, uh, if you look at all these open circles, these are basically uh, theoretical, the theory, what the theory predicts. On the other hand, if you look at these solid squares or the triangles, that's the data which is similar to support the idea that if you somehow can um, reduce the size of this zinc oxide, then eventually, right after you pass this 4 nanometers, things are going to really become, it's still zinc oxide, but the band gap here, it dramatically increased from that 3.4 EVs to almost like 5.5 EVs. Right? And there are a lot of, again, experiments supporting that idea. So this is basically a diagram that shows you what exactly happens when you have this uh, band gap from this VB valence band to the conduction band. All right, so, the, uh, so that's kind of the, uh, the, the, the interesting thing we want to really demonstrate in the lab. So here's how we make this sample in the lab. So we, again, we use that uh, uh, electro deposition here. So this is basically, we start with that, uh, you know, these uh, mechanical polish paper to make sure the surface is smooth enough. And then eventually, after that electro polish, we did this uh, uh, deposition using that zinc nitrate, right? So uh, the, the idea here is that we want to really see or compare how the morphology changed if we really anneal the sample in air at a slightly, you know, close to 300, 350 degrees, because that's one um, technique uh, you could use to form these uh, nanometer scaled features. So I'm going to now put these two uh, SEM pictures together uh, to show you how this um, annealing really affected the, uh, the morphology. So here, this left side shows you what exactly happened when you have a, um, an as-prepared sample, which means it's a fresh sample. You don't have to do anything after the growth. So you simply put the sample in the SEM, and overall, it's not really that smooth, but you don't really see that many features. On the other hand, if you anneal the sample at a 350 degrees, well, you start really seeing these kind of like a pillars, little tiny pillars uh, forming on the surface of this aluminum. All right, so that's it. if you, again, if you look at the size of each wire or pillar here, it's about a 300 or 400 nanometers, right? Now, of course, and this is not the only way one can form these nanometer scaled uh, pillars. So we're now actually in the process of searching for a better way to make these nanometer scaled uh, zinc ox oxide pillars. On the other hand, one could also do the similar scan in, in terms of uh, determining the ratio of that zinc to oxygen. So for instance, here's a, uh, we, we've done many different scans using that EDX. So you, you can clearly see that the sample here overall, they have a really similar uh, spectrum here because of the uh, zinc and, and oxide. But when you look at the, the, uh, the summary, uh, based on all these measurements, one can clearly see the annealing here dramatically changed the ratio of that oxygen to zinc. If you look at this as grown sample, it was almost like 3.5 to 1. And after you anneal the sample in air at a 350 degrees, the ratio is pretty close to 1 to 1. All right, so this seems to indicate that the fresh sample does have a lot of actual oxygen um, because of the boundary and the cluster and so on. But once you anneal this sample, now you start seeing this 1 to 1 ratio. So the question here is, other than this, what else happened because of that annealing? So here's the, uh, the X-ray data. Now, overall, if you look at the, the as prepared sample, fresh sample versus that uh, um, anneal sample, nothing seems to really say changing that dramatically. So, overall, you would still have this zinc oxide, 1, 0, 0, all these kind of possible uh, peaks here. But the interesting thing here is, first of all, using this room temperature, almost room temperature um, electro deposition, one could actually make these crystals, right? That's one, one, one thing. The other thing is, it's a low temperature technique. If you ask people working in industry, normally they would have to use something at 800 or 900 degrees. It's a very high temperature technique to make this 
zinc oxide. So what we are trying to demonstrate here is one can actually use this room temperature technique to make these crystals. On the other hand, you may also wonder, well, how does this thing really uh, become something that's interesting? So we have to look at the optical properties because remember the idea is zinc oxide is a directly band gap material. So what happened to the optical properties? So here's something we have in the uh, laser lab. We're going to use this YAG laser and uh, put the sample into a little tiny uh, crowd uh, stat so we can really change the uh, temperature of the sample. And then eventually we have the detector that's going to measure the photoluminescence. So here's the, uh, the basic idea that uh, um, if you look at this zinc oxide, what happens here is that if you turn on the laser, well, you know that the laser has a shorter wavelength or more energy because of these photons. When these photons hit the, uh, the material, eventually some of the electrons are going to really jump from the valence band to the conduction band. But then again, this is not really a stable state. These electrons, because they have higher energy, they will be back to these little tiny holes. And that process is going to be uh, giving us these, um, these photoluminescence or lights that we call photoluminescence. So that luminescence is really due to that photon excitation here. Uh, so this is basically the data, what the, uh, the, the fresh sample look like. And I'm showing you three different temperatures from 35 Kelvin to 90 to 150 uh, Kelvin. So overall, you see, things are pretty similar. Now, I would like to just point out to you, the, 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 the sharpest peak here is really due to the pump line. So that's the, the, the line from the YAG laser. And then these little tiny peaks here, this one, this one, and these. These are also, we have verified in the lab. These are also from uh, the, the laser source. So what about this peak and this quite broad peak here. Now these two, it turns out these are really from that zinc oxide. And the UV peak here is because of that band to band transition. One can actually measure the wavelengths and you can right away see the, uh, the wavelength here is about a 370 nanometers. If you remember the number that I showed you a few minutes ago, the band gap of zinc oxide is about a 3.37 EVs corresponding to 370 nanometers. So that peak is really due to the excitation of these electrons from the valence band to the conduction band and eventually they fall back and that process is accompanied by this photo emission. So on the other hand, now you do also notice we also have a quite broad uh, band here. This is known as the green peak and that green peak is typically due to these defects in the material. Okay. So room temperature, again, it is a nice technique and you can make it a thin film. But on the other hand, it often also comes with tons of these defects in the material. So these material, eventually, when these defects absorb the, the laser, the energy, well, they will also become part of that um, photo emission process. So that's why you also see the, uh, this broader peak here. Right? Uh, on the other hand, one can also look at this, the sample that we annealed at uh, 350 degrees. All right? Now, generally speaking, well, it really looks like the one um, as, we, as I showed you uh, a couple of minutes ago. So overall, you have this UV peak, you have this broad peak. But now you notice that the intensity here, it's a lot more than even the intensity of the pump line. Right? So that is telling you this annealing technique. Actually, it's kind of like a healing the material. So somehow, doing this annealing, you eliminate it, many, many defects. And the material itself, it becomes a lot more crystalline. So that's why the intensity here, especially this main peak here, it really increased by a factor of three or five in this particular case. Um, so now as an exercise, well, one would also uh, want to look into this particular uh, fitting technique, for example, how do I really know the change of the peak position and the intensity as a function of temperature? So here's what we do mathematically. Um, as you can see from this one here, so mainly you're going to have one sharp peak due to that uh, pump line. You also have this UV peak and this broad band here. So what we did here was to fit all these three different peaks so that we can really extract information in terms of the intensity of every single peak and the position of each peak. Uh, so this is the formula we use. So as you can see, the intensity here is going to depend on 10 different parameters. Right? So mathematically, well, 
it's very hard to uh, find any analytical solution. But fortunately enough, the program can basically, I used origin to do this. So you can really see, for example, I have P1 all the way through P10. So we have 10 different parameters to really simulate this um, optical emission here. And by the end of this fitting, you can really now get the uh, peak position. You also can get the intensity and the width of each peak. All right? So then eventually, of course, now you can put all the data together right, to see how this annealing affects the uh, peak intensity, especially now the UV peak. I'm not very much interested in that broad peak. So here, these red dots here represent the, the sample that was annealed at uh, 350 degrees. And these uh, triangles here are the ones from the uh, fresh sample. So overall, you can see, especially at the low temperature, you can see that the intensity of that peak, the UV peak, it just it's increased by a factor of